Chapter 5 of Mari, Our Little Norwegian Cousin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mari, Our Little Norwegian Cousin by Mary Hazelton Blankard Wade. Chapter 5 The Birthday. Ten years old, my daughter. Do you believe you have grown any taller since last night? said Mari's mother when she called her that morning. It seems so, anyway, answered the little girl, as she watched her mother making the birthday cake. Bring the citron and currants from the storeroom, Mari. I have sugar enough, I think. This must be a beautiful cake for my daughter. The frosting shall be thick. Here comes Ola now with the flowers. Ola's arms were full. Do you think I have enough to decorate your cake, Mari? He laughed as he spoke. We can't use half of them, of course. Look at the quantity of fruit mother is using. There! See how yellow the dough looks, since she put in the saffron. Won't it be lovely when it's done? Come, Ola, get to work now on the tub you're making for me. And, Mari, take your knitting and go out on the porch. I wish to be quiet while I watch the baking of the cake. There will be fun enough for you this afternoon. Mari's mother had promised her a coffee party in honor of her birthday. Soon after dinner the children began to arrive. They were dressed in their best and looked very happy, although the white kerchiefs tied around the rosy faces of the girls made them appear like little old women. There was plenty of coffee to drink, for the children of the North are as fond of it as the older people. Then there was a magnificent birthday cake, rich in fruits and sugar, and trimmed with the flowers Ola had gathered in the morning. Of course there were piles of flat bread on the table, besides other things of which children were fond. Many games were played outdoors in the sunshine. Mulberry bush was the favorite, and it was played over and over again. I shall never forget my tenth birthday, said Mari that night, after her little friends had gone home. I have had a lovely time, mother, and you were so good to let me have the party. You can repay me by being more diligent in all your work the coming year, my child. Learn to be more careful in your knitting and spinning. Always be ready with a cheerful face to help me in the churning, and I shall think you are growing to be a noble woman. Our little cousin certainly had many duties. Her hands were seldom idle during the long winter afternoons and evenings, for there were stockings to knit for all and herself, scarves to crochet, wool to be spun and woven, besides many other things which Norse girls need to learn if they are to grow up to be good housekeepers. And Ola had much to do also. In summer there was plenty of work in the garden, besides fishing and shooting the wild ducks. During the winter time he must make many useful things at his carpenter's bench. His father was his teacher in this kind of work. Why, he had made every piece of furniture in the house, and although it was not beautiful, it was well made and strong. I love to carve, Ola once said to his sister. I wish it were the fashion to decorate our buildings as the people of Telemark can do. I have seen pictures of their storehouses. They're just beautiful, Mari. The men carve with their knives all sorts of figures on the outside. The side posts of the porches are fairly covered with lovely patterns. The people there don't dress as we do, either, answered Mari. Even the farmers wear the same clothes at work as on the holidays. I should think it would be hard to keep clean their white jackets all trimmed with silver buttons. The women there sometimes make their aprons out of silk handkerchiefs and they wear the silver belts and brooches every day. I should like to go there and see them. Just think, Ola, I've never been away from this place in my life. Never mind, little sister. You and I will travel some day and go all over our country. We'll even go to the North Cape and see the sun set at midnight and then rise a moment afterward. We can almost do that here on midsummer nights, but not quite. You know, people from all over the world travel to the North Cape, Mari. What else do they see there besides the midnight sunset and sunrise? Our friend Ernst, over in the village, went there once. He belonged to the crew of a ship that carries people there every summer. He says it is a high mass of rocks, and it's hard to climb. When you reach a top, you can get a good view of the Arctic Ocean, but there is nothing to see but the dreary weather, no land nor ship in sight. That is, of course, as you look towards the north. On one side of the cape there is a small glacier, but those can be seen in many other parts of the country. One doesn't need to go to the north cape to look at a glacier. Our teacher told me, Ole, that a long time ago this whole country was covered with ice. Of course, there were no people then, 
but after a while the land became warmer and the ice went away. Here and there the ice rivers or glaciers were left among the mountains, and they have stayed there ever since. I don't see why. Of course, it's terribly cold above us, Marty, up among the mountains. The snow falls and changes into ice. It slides slowly down into the valley and begins to melt. But there is always plenty of ice above. People like to come to our country to see the glaciers as well as the other wonderful sights. I declare I'm getting sleepy and I'm going to bed. Good night, little sister. End of chapter 5